I'm live. Oh, people are joining. Okay, it's happening. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining, everybody. I'm Lisa Maxson. I'm super excited to welcome you virtually into my studio. Um, it's so nice to see people's names pop up and know that somehow we're together. Um, even though here I am talking to an empty room. Hi. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Lisa Maxson. I'm originally from Russia. Um, my family immigrated to the United States uh, 30 years ago, and we settled in Columbus, Ohio, which is actually where I am currently. Um, typically, I'm um, in New York, but... During these special times, I've come back and started uh, living with my parents again, and my son, and um, my partner. So we're all in a small house, <laughs> very cozy, and I think maybe they're watching. So hi, Kieran, if you're watching, hello. Um, Kieran is my son. Um, so um, I, I got very lucky, and I'm able to have a studio uh, in um, the, I'm getting some funny comments, so um, I yeah I got a studio here in Columbus at this really wonderful place called Millworks, um, and um, have been making some work, so I'm excited to share that with you. Um, but first, I'm just gonna maybe talk a little bit about my practice, and um, oh, and I should also mention that. Um, my relationship with Wasaic Project goes way back to almost a decade ago. I was in a group show in um, at Wasaic in 2011, and um, in 2016 I was. Um, oh, I gotta clean my handle. I just got a reminder. Okay, let's see if I could do this. Um, special. Did that work? Aha, uh -huh. pin comment. Okay. All right. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, yeah, so I was saying um, I was in, in a couple of shows at Wasaic. I love that place. It's so special. I love everybody who runs it and makes it so amazing. And I also did a um, a residency there in 2016, and it was really wonderful because I was able to bring my son, who was like one and a half at the time, and um, and my partner, and um, it was really nice to be able to make work, but also have time with my family. So highly recommend that for those of you who don't know about that option. Um, anyways, so I'll just tell you a little bit about my practice and my interests in general, and then I'll show you around the studio. Um, so um, I have a background in um, literature and um, also in costume design. And, um, but then I went to school for fine art and studied painting. So I've always sort of tried to figure out how to synthesize these things. Hi, Lucy. Um, and um, how to kind of uh, navigate these interests all together. And um, I started working with fabric in grad school. I mean, I was I, I did costume design in college um, as kind of my extracurricular activity. And um, I was really interested in stretch fabrics, mostly because my skills as a seamstress were very um, not impressive. And so spandex had this amazing quality of fitting without having to be tailored. So, uh, but then when I really started focusing on painting, I, um, I realized that uh, fabric has this immediate relationship to the body um, and kind of maybe uh, in some ways uh, lightens the mood in a painting, um, even though paintings are traditionally made with fabric where we kind of neutralize that fact that paintings oftentimes are on 
canvas or linen or other fabrics, and we think of them as this other thing, but really they are very much related and connected to paintings. So um, I, I made fabric works for a long time that um, were sort of more traditional paintings wrapped in fabric. But then I started thinking about the relationship of painting and architecture and painting and the body and uh, body and architecture and kind of trying to figure out how the triad all fits together. And um, that's when I started um, doing my uh, site-specific interventions for buildings and kind of thinking of them as um, architectural makeovers or architectural drag. So thinking of giving uh, buildings kind of a gender makeover because a lot of buildings feel very male to me. Um, and it just seemed like it would be interesting to see how could we change the gender of a building? And could it be done through spandex, for example? So, hello. Um, all these waves coming in. I want to be waving back, but that would get boring after a while. Um, for you, not for me. I could just keep waving. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so, um, yeah, I, um, I'm going to share my screen in a second and show you some... Um, works um, that are, you know, not in the studio, just so you could see some completed pieces. Uh, but before that, I'll mention that during this, you know, time of lockdown, I, um, I pretty much focused on two kind of side projects. One was, um, or is, I'm still doing it, um, I'm making um, neoprene masks from the remnants of my um, large-scale project at, at the De Cordova Museum um, called Turret Tops. And um, here, I'll put one on for you. I started making them in um, two colors. And you could still get one, and they're free. It's donation-based, so anybody who needs one could just... Um, Follow me on Instagram and send me a DM, and uh, I would just need your name and your address and your color preference, and I'll make you a mask. So, and you do not need to make a donation. It's obviously a donation. So, um, but that's been a really a generative thing for me because all of the remnants um, from the masks um, ended up being really exciting to my son, Kieran. And um, so I'll, we started collaborating because he told me one day that he wants to be an artist and teacher like Mama when he grows up. So I was thrilled and I said, well, let's start going to the studio together. And um, so I'm going to show you first some of these things that we've been working on. These are all in progress. So I have like a whole bag of... Um, you know, the negative um, kind of remnants of the masks. So these are all the holes, cut out holes, and these are all the, the line trims of the, the edge. So basically, first he started sorting that and was really into that. And then once we started coming to the studio and he started, uh, you know, um, drawing with permanent marker on some pieces of neoprene and cutting out other pieces and painting on them and then arranging them on canvases. And here are some of our collaborations, which has been like one of the most joyous things I've ever had happen to me. So, and this is actually something he just did last uh, time he was here. This is in case you can't tell, it's a fluffy orange cat wearing a big necklace. So there it is. And see, he's, this is also using the remnants, the neoprene remnants. So um, that has been really fun. And um, okay, let's see. Um, OK, so, so that's pretty much what I've been focusing on most of the time. Um, but I'm also working on some other 
uh, pieces in the studio that I'll show you in a second, but I want to contextualize them a little bit better. Um, hi, Jason. Hi, Joshua. Uh, this is so fun. Um, I should do this like every day. Um, it would get boring for you. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to just um, share my screen and talk about two projects that are sort of in, in process right now. Um, and then I'll show you the stuff in the studio. Okay, so um, this is the De Cordova uh, Museum and Sculpture Park in um, Lincoln, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Um, I was asked by Sarah Montrose, the curator um, at the De Cordova, to propose a project. And I, um, as, as often uh, as this, uh, you know, when this happens, when I have a site-specific project, I, I go to the site and kind of research it and, and try to discover it and see what um, kind of stands out to me the most. And I was really drawn to these turret tops, the, these canonical shapes, which are really large. Um, they don't look as large, you know, in the architectural scale, but they're over 20 feet tall and um, 20 feet in diameter. So, uh, but they're completely dead space. In other words, they, they cannot be entered or used in any way, so they're purely decorative. And I thought it was very interesting that um, so much articulated architectural space was rendered useless um, kind of by design, and also that they happen to be kind of the most feminine form in the entire structure. So I decided to remake them to scale on the grounds of the sculpture park. And here, so this was um, in August of this last summer. And um, they're there now um, for the last however many months. Um, and they're weathering all the elements. And that's kind of part of the of the idea behind them. I wanted these neoprene turret tops to live and change as they um, sit outdoors. They are enterable and you could go inside and this is a, an interior view. Here's a, another interior view of the plum colored one. Here's a view of, from inside the plum turret, looking at the pink turret. And so um, throughout this year, they, they've been documented in different seasons um, to, uh, <clears throat> to kind of capture how the work itself is living and changing and how the landscape is changing around it. So um, here they are in the winter. And this is in the fall. Sorry that they're out of order here. Um, <clears throat> well, and uh, this summer, the top layer of the turret tops is going to be unveiled. And their um, bikini tans, that's how I've been thinking of it, will be revealed. So basically, the, the garment layer of the turret tops will come off and there will be uh, sun bleached impressions on the neoprene. And the neoprene is, for those of you who are not as familiar with it, um, neoprene is this like fleshy um, fabric that's kind of thick and spongy and is used for wetsuits and shapewear. And it's, um, it's a very kind of gendered fabric. And um, so I, I um, in order to prepare, to kind of know uh, better how uh, the sun is going to bleach the neoprene, I made a series of paintings um, on my fire escape that in New York and then later in Texas um, that kind of um, explored the bleaching process. So this is an example of one painting where you could see how over a period of two months um, there was significant color uh, changing. So hopefully when this unveiling takes place this summer, um, sometimes in July or August, we're kind of in the process of figuring that out because everything is on hold, as everybody knows. 
So once that does happen, there will be some kind of reveal of what that um, looks like. And um, I'm very excited, but also anxious to see um, how they've changed. Um, and I miss them and I hope they're okay. Um, so, okay, and um, oops. Um, hmm. Okay, so then the other project I wanted to quickly share with you while I have you in this screen share is something I did um, at, at this fall at the Chinati um, Foundation in Marfa, Texas, where I was a artist in resident. Um, I, I worked in this um, studio building that um, was all for the artists and residents. It was like a standalone structure that had over a dozen doors because it, it's an old meat locker. So some doors, let's see, oh, I can't zoom in here. Um, some doors were, you know, really thick and squat, some double doors, some vaulted doors, some doors that were broken, some doors that were functional. And it was kind of this like dizzying um, door extravaganza. And at the same time, kind of serendipitously, I was reading a lot about um, ancient Egyptians um, false doors, this idea that the ancient Egyptians had that our spirit needs a passageway just like our body does. So in order to pass to like another room, we enter a door, but in order for our spirit to pass into another place, it also needs a, a, a false door. Um, so there were, they made these beautiful kind of images of doors chiseled into and or painted in, onto tombs and temples. So I was really interested in this concept and I decided to make portraits or i.e. false doors of some of the doors in my studio. So this one is the front door. Um, so the whole series is called Chinati Falls Doors. And here's another one. And now I'm going to switch. Um, how do I do that back to myself? Oh. oh, I could keep that. I don't really need that. Maybe. Hmm. Okay, well, I guess that could just stay up there. I'm not really sure how to get rid of it. Um, you still see that picture, I guess, right? I can't. Okay, well, in any case, I'm going to show you around my studio now. Okay, so here is one of the Chinati Falls doors. I, I went ahead and put it up here just so I could show it to you. Um, this was the double doors in the back of my studio. And I'll just get a little closer here to show you some of the details. This is uh, dye, linen, um, neoprene, um, flash, and some oil stick. So I, um, you know, a lot of these um, doors that I've worked on in Texas felt very um, exciting to me. And so when I got my studio here in Ohio, I decided to continue with the doors. And um, here's my studio door here that I, I've come to uh, be pretty fond of. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm making, instead of making one uh, portrait of multiple doors, I'm making multiple portraits of a single door. So I have, um, well, this one is just, you know, basically um, linen with, with uh, pieces of fabric that I'm trying to figure out, you know, what I want color-wise. I'm just trying to figure that out. And this one... I do work on them kind of I, I, flat on the floor um, until you know they're figured out and then I um, stiffen them with fabric stiffener and, and fabric glue. 
not that much space here, but so you could see like that, I pinned that one up, but it's, it's very much an early stage. They're all in very early stages, but there's, there's four doors that are sort of happening um, in order to get to some kind of portrait of this door. And uh, what I do a lot is I um, rip linen strips because um, again, I'm, I'm obsessed with the ancient Egyptians and I think a lot about the act of caring for, for the dead through mummification. So, you know, um, linen bandages was how mummies or bodies were mummified. So I, um, I tear um, linen strips and then I launder and iron them to kind of get these edges. And then I paint on them with dye and um, other, you know, like I use flash and acrylic. And, oh, and let's see, the other thing I wanted to show you was my obsession with Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was the um, 18th century, uh, 18th dynasty, um, ancient Egypt, Egyptian female pharaoh. And she was essentially the first known cross-dresser because um, she, as a pharaoh, she decided that she should, you know, wear the whole pharaoh's garb and the um, and the false beard, which is um, likely the reason why she was effectively erased from history um, by her successor, who hated her. Um, okay. Now I'm back. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really, I'm really interested in her um, and and her kind of um, like the female authority that conjured up these very monumental architectural structures that were then attributed to other male relatives of hers, including her successor, her stepson who hated her. Um, but uh, she ruled Egypt for 20 years and she made some of the most lasting contributions. And when, um, when her stepson um, took over um, after her death, he basically had um, all of her statuary dumped into a big quarry outside of the site of her famous uh, mortuary temple. And, um, and of course, it was such an act of erasure, but um, conveniently for archaeologists, 3,000 years later, when they discovered that site, all of the pieces of these priceless statues were there in one place because they were all dumped into this big hole. And so that place has come to be known as Hatshepsut's Hole, um, which I just find very uh, moving and interesting. Um, as a kind of conceptual parallel to how you know women have been treated, um, so yeah. Anyways, that's kind of what I've been wanting to share with you. I um, one of the things that I find really interesting with my with the masks that I'm making now is that in the fall when I was making all these portraits of Hatshepsut, I was making them. Um, with with this um, upside down triangle covering her mouth, um, and to me, you know, it had that was like a sign of silencing and, and, and erasing. But now, with these masks, uh, some of which, by the way, I started drawing on because neoprene is really fun to draw on, so. So yeah, I feel like the work oftentimes is ahead of, of me um, in what it, I'm actually really doing. So in this case, it, you know, it took like a good six months for me to be like, oh, the masks are connected to Hatshepsut. And <laughs> this whole notion of, you know, is it, is it veiling to protect or is it veiling to silence and erase? 
So that's kind of um, a lot of times something that I muse over when I think about my architectural interventions and this notion of dressing up buildings um, and what do we gain when we cover something up. So yeah, I think that's what I wanted to share. So um, if anybody has any questions or you know anything you want me to talk more about, um, so yeah, any, I, I have Will Hutnick here live telling me if there's any, yeah. Um, I still don't know how to get rid of this um, image from my camera, but maybe I just need to See if I could. Ah, uh huh. Okay, great. This is really kind of a fun new experience for me. So thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. It's really satisfying to see um, your names pop up and feel connected in this way. Really appreciate it. Um, it's been fun, and um, hopefully. Um, I covered all the things I wanted to cover. I'm sure as soon as this is over, I'll be like, oh, I meant to tell them about this super important thing. Um, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe I'll just be like, I hit it, all the points. I did write them all out ahead of time, you know, just to be extra studious. Um, let's see, I'll show you my golden door again. Oh, wait, okay, I'll show you my son's collaboration. I just think they're so lovely. I have so much fun with him. I hope he's watching so he knows that I'm sharing the work that we've made together. And there's the door. I think like what really interests me about making these false doors out of stiffened fabric is um, the you know, the relationship of kind of the, the rigidity of architecture and how it translates or can be sort of questioned through these semi-hard um, um, fabrics. So it's like you could tell that it's fabric because you know what fabric looks like, but at the same time, when you're physically in front of it, you know that something is different about it because it's it's stiff. So it's, it's more like... Um, it's more like a skin than, it moves more like a stiff skin than like a flowy fabric. Okay, let me see if I got any questions here. Oh, yes. Okay, let's see. Questions, um, are the doors going deeper to the painting or are a way to question from Zahar? That's, that's, that's deep. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Are the doors going deeper to the painting or are a way to question painting? Um, I mean, I love painting. Um, I'm really, I love looking at painting. I love, you know, the history of painting. Um, I think it's very problematic who has been allowed to make paintings or at least who whose paintings have been canonized. Um, so I think we're in a point where we could, a much wider slice of the population could give themselves permission to make paintings. So I certainly, um, I'm interested in, in the expansion that that allows for. And I do think that maybe as a woman or as an immigrant or you know, whatever um, other qualifiers I could put on myself, I, I'm sure that those things inform my painting. So I, I, as much as I love painting, I do think that there's an implicit critique within the paintings I make because I feel like my voice wasn't included previously in the history of painting. And 
And I do think that there's something different to say. I don't know if that answers your question, Zahar. I kind of rambled. But let's see, what's the net? Do you have any public projects in the works? Um, I do, but everything is so um, up in the air right now. So many of my, I'm actually on sabbatical this year, but a lot of my projects got either canceled or postponed because of the pandemic. So um, I, I don't want to jinx it by talking too much about future projects. Uh, next question, what do you th think about your use of elongated rectangles? I feel like I see this in your work again and, and again in the doors. Yeah, I, that's such a great observation and a great question. Um, I, um, I'm really drawn to rectangles. I started making long rectangular paintings um, in 2017 when I was at Banff and they were smaller than doors, but they were the shape of doors. And I thought of them as baths and sinks, um, but they were also very much doors. Um, and then when I was at Chinati, I just was so moved by all of the doors in the meat locker that I was constantly in that I just kind of, and of course the false doors of ancient Egyptians kind of made this concept solidified, but I, th I think I'm drawn to the rectangle because it's, it's figurative. It kind of implies the figure, it implies the coffin, it implies the table. Like it, it's such a, um, it, it, maybe our body just implicitly knows that you could fit yourself into this space and, um, and it's both, there's like a bodily relationship that is established that is maybe beyond uh, kind of a conscious understanding, at least for me right now. Um, okay, uh, last question. Can you talk about your thoughts on the relationship to the body and movement? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely um, think about, I think about the body a lot, like wh why is it that we live in um, square rooms um, and why is so much architecture um, rectilinear while our bodies are so not. We don't have any straight lines in our bodies, um, no right angles. So we are essentially, like the Western architecture has um, basically put us into boxes that are not very um, in sync with our bodies. And maybe one could even go as far as to say they shame our bodies because there's kind of an implied perfection to a square or a rectangle or a straight, straight line, a kind of machine perfection, and our bodies are very imperfect. And, and you know, maybe that, that has to do with wanting to, like humans want to aspire towards perfection and towards um, longevity and posterity, um, and I think, you know, all of that makes sense, but at the same time, I think it's more important to have a lived experience that feels resonant with the body and with our, our lived experience, right? The fact that we age and that we, you know, we're not these perfect and impenetrable containers and there's all kinds of things that happen that are maybe somewhat embarrassing. Um, and I think that that, like when art, when I encounter art that speaks to that, to these more vulnerable aspects of our lived experience, um, I, I feel very moved by that art. And so I think I, think I aspire to make work that is more, um, more along those lines. Um, oh, and Mike, Mike Embron says um, he, that he sees lettering. Is there writing on the doors? That is such, that's so interesting. I, um, there was, um, there's been so much writing in my older work, especially in college and, and grad school. I, I really, maybe because of my literary training, I really wanted to, um, to include language in the work. Um, and so I was making works that spelled things out. Um, and every once in a while I do kind of return to that 
or return to the notion that uh, symbols and characters could add up to meaning. So sometimes like, it's not really spelling out a word, but I am implying some kind of written system um, of signs and symbols. So I think, I think I'm just gonna end there. I hope I didn't miss anybody's question. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. I love the questions. Um, it's really, I feel very um, satisfied to have this conversation, even though I am alone in my room. I feel very connected to you all out there. Um, I'm very grateful for your time. Um, thank you so much. And make sure you tune in again next week for um, Tiffany Smith's Open Studio. I'm very excited for that. This whole um, Wednesday um, open studio with artists live streaming on Wasaic, Wasaic Project has been so wonderful. I, I love um, seeing it. So hopefully you're all um, planning to attend all of the lineup. There's, there's lots of fun um, artists coming up. So thank you so much, everybody. It's really, really a pleasure. I feel super happy to share this with you. Bye.